2014 is when we sold our house, started RVing full time. I'm now out in Arizona, which are which is where I was back in January. Also, when the escapers had the bash out here, and uh, I've been growing my beard ever since. Okay, so multi-state income tax. Uh, four rules of thumb I wanted to share with everybody today, and especially for those who are just getting started and thinking about it. Um, one of your key decisions is which state you're going to choose to domicile, that legal term that we all learned when we went to RV for the first time. Um, if you no longer own any real estate in any particular uh, state, um, which one do you choose for your home? And of course, we all gravitate towards those states where there's no income tax. That's one of the benefits is you get to choose, uh, you don't have to pay state income tax anymore uh, if you domicile from a uh, with a state like Texas, like I do. Others do Florida, South Dakota are popular, and there's actually eight states that don't have income tax for individuals. Business can be a little different story, but those eight states, including the three I just mentioned, there's no income tax. Well, the first rule of thumb is if you're working and earning an income by providing services, um, some of the language you'll read in the state, in the instructions for state income tax returns is uh, if you're earning income, if you're providing services for financial gain or profit. So if you're conducting those types of activities and you're in a state that has an income tax, um, they, the, the, the income taxing state doesn't care what your domicile is. It doesn't matter if you domicile in an income tax free state, if you're actually performing work in a state that has an income tax. So the first rule of thumb is now, now domiciling in an income tax free state has many other benefits beyond just this one uh, issue of, of being taxed. Um, but um, that sounds kind of funny. Well, maybe I'll explain that more later. But anyway, um, so the the first rule of thumb is uh, your domicile doesn't matter when it comes to whether you might be or subject to to use the technical term that you'll see in the in the tax booklets. Um, the fact that you domicile in an income tax free state uh, doesn't matter when determining whether you're subject to income tax in a taxing state. Um, what does matter? What does matter is where you are when you're performing the work. I think I just alluded to that a little bit earlier. So, uh, so I'm a Texas resident. I domicile in Texas. I, I don't have any real estate that I own in Texas or any other state. I, we travel full time and, and live and work out of our RV. Um, but for example, I'm in Arizona right now while doing things like I'm uh, doing these days, tax returns, earning an income, handling tax returns. Um, I am subject to Arizona state income tax. Now I use the word subject to, or the phrase subject to, um, uh, specifically because just because I'm subject to income tax doesn't necessarily mean I have to file and pay income tax to Arizona. There's some other factors that come into the equation that we'll talk about later. Uh, but the key first rule of thumb is um, having a domicile in an income tax free state is not like your the equivalent of a get out of jail free card um, that allows you to never have to be have a, a state tax liability. Um, so uh, another factor is how much time you spend in a state. Um, you're you're probably all familiar with with a state from an income tax uh, perspective will deem you as either a resident, a non-resident, or part year resident. So as an individual, if, if you live like most people do in a house in a state and you live there year round, you're just a regular full year resident and you fill out the, the resident version of their tax return. If you move out of the state or move into the state in the middle of a year, uh, then you'll be filling out a part year resident version of their income tax form. But if you're say a nomad RV traveler like I am, and I'm in Arizona, um, and if I stay in Arizona for more than six months, they will 
deem me, the term is called a statutory resident. So by law, by the code of the law, they will designate me and treat me as if I'm a full year resident if I'm in the state earning an income for more than six months, or excuse me, Arizona is nine months. Other states like Virginia is six months, Colorado is six months. So the key with this rule of thumb is that time spent in a state does matter is uh, if you're gonna spend a significant amount of time in a state more than three months, um, find out what that threshold is. You don't wanna be there so long that they treat you as a full year resident. Um, and here's why. Um, so let's, let's use Virginia for an example. If I'm, in, and the days don't have to be consecutive days. So over the course of a tax year, if I spend one day more than six months in Virginia, Virginia is gonna say, Tim, you, are, you need to fill out the full year resident income tax form. And all of the income you earn for the entire year is subject to Virginia income tax. Even though I wasn't in the state for five plus months, they're still gonna uh, tax me for 12 months of income. Now those other five plus months, I might've spent a good portion of those in another state that charges income tax and they're gonna want me to file and pay income tax to them. So now I'm paying state tax on the same dollar of income. And uh, now many times states, you can get a credit with one state if you've paid income tax in another state, but now, now you're just adding layers of complexity to an already difficult situation. So, so uh, it's best to just stay under those time thresholds so that you remain a non-resident in terms of your filing status so that even if you do have to file, you're only gonna have to be paying a tax on the portion of your income that you earned during the time you're in the state. So back to Virginia, if I stayed there one day less, well, let's just make the math easy. If I stayed there five months instead of six months plus one day, um, I would have to pay tax on what I earned during those five months. I wouldn't have to pay tax on my full 12 months of, of earned income. Okay, so um, uh, just kind of a rule of thumb too, uh, or a tax tip is, if I know I'm gonna be, let's just say I'm gonna be in Virginia, let's ratchet it down to something more re realistic. Let's say, cause I have family there. Let's say over the course of the year, I'm gonna be there for two months, all total out of the year. Um, it's probably good if I try and, uh, it, you know, I, I could just allocate my annual income and pay tax or file and pay tax on two twelfths of my income, or if I'm creative, I can organize my jobs and my projects that are due, uh, th that I'm working on, uh, try and take more, quote, days off while I'm in Virginia, a taxing state, um, or lower paying projects that I'm working on, or schedule more of my administrative work. As a CPA, I have to do 40 hours a year in continuing education. So if I'm gonna spend a significant time in a state that has an income tax, maybe I'll try and organize my workload so that I do continuing education as much as possible while I'm in that state. Well, that's not an activity that's earning me an income, so it's not gonna create a tax liability for that state. Okay, so two rule, rules of thumb, domicile doesn't matter as much as where you are, what state you're physically located in when you're doing your work, and the other rule of thumb is time matters. The amount of time you spend in the state you wanna stay under the uh, threshold for what determines whether you're gonna be treated as a full year resident or a non-resident. Okay, the third rule of thumb is your mode of work um, does matter. Um, well, excuse me, sometimes it matters. Most of the time, now I've not dealt with all 42 income taxing states yet, maybe I will, um, but, um, and I've not, uh, uh, contacted or talked to tax agents in their states, but those that I have dealt with, um, uh, most of them say how you conduct your work doesn't matter. If you're physically present in our state while you're doing your work, that's what puts you in the category of being subject to income tax. So, and, and what I'm 
really referring to here is many of us do our work over the internet. So I may be in Virginia or like right now I'm in Arizona and uh, just broadcasting to the tax authorities that I will probably have an Arizona income tax liability this year. So I better do it right. But anyway, um, uh, um, the fact that I'm sitting in front of my computer in my laptop or sitting in my lawn chair, uh, excuse me, sitting in front of my laptop in my RV or sitting in my lawn chair outside of the RV, um, but, but literally literally just talking on the phone with customers that I have around the country. I'm just thinking, I don't even have a customer in the state of Arizona. So, um, uh, but anyway, um, I, I'm not going to a physical building where I have a customer or if I'm an employee, I'm not going into my employer's office in Arizona. So the question uh, when you read the instructions, they don't get down into these details. They just say, um, they just say, if you derive income from Arizona sources, well, what does that mean? Does that mean if I have a customer in Virginia, but I'm never in Virginia, does that mean I have to pay Virginia income tax? Because does that count as a source of income just because my customer is there? Well, so you have to call. The, the departments of revenue or departments of taxation, sometimes they're called franchise tax board. But if you Google, you can find the state taxing authority, get their phone number, give them a call and ask questions. I was just on the phone with Illinois today. Um, and uh, I'll tell you about how that call went in just a minute. But um, so, uh, so I'll call and say, okay, how do you define, what, is, what does it mean to derive income from Virginia sources? And they'll say, if you if you prompt them and keep getting them to dig, eventually what they'll say, this is what I've found across the board is, oh, it's when you're physically present in our state. If you're never in our state, then uh, earning an income by providing services. Now, if you owned real estate, bought and sold it in a different state, and never set foot in that state, you'd have a capital gain, hopefully. You know, that's a different situation. But in terms of the services you provide, um, earning an income through the services that you provide. If you never set foot in the state, even if you have customers in that state paying, generally the states are going to say, no, 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 you're not liable for tax. You're not subject to tax. It's only if you're physically in our state. And then I'll say, well, what if I'm sitting in my RV and working on the, over the internet all the time? I'm not going into anybody's office, et cetera, et cetera. And, and in most cases, the what I've heard from the states is they'll say it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what mode of work, how you're conducting your work. What matters is you're physically in our state. Now, um, Georgia is a state that I found um, where they say, oh, oh, if, if all you're doing is, is working in front of your computer, then no, no, you're not subject to tax. Now, here's what I'll do, probably because I'm a nerd accountant and I'm a little bit OCD and I want to make sure <laughs> that I'm doing it right is I will call back again and get a different tax agent because they're all human. They're not, they don't know frontwards and backwards their tax law. And I want to get some corroborating evidence. I want to get two people to give me the same answer. Then I can have a high level of confidence that uh, if I ever got called before a tax judge, you know, that, that I'd get a favorable decision. So um, by the way, that's never happened. <laughs> so anyway, uh, and hopefully it never will happen, but, um, okay. So, uh, so in Georgia, I called a second time and got the same answer. So I'm like, that is good. There's been other situations, not on this particular topic, but like with Virginia, um, I hired my daughter who's works part-time for me and she lives in Virginia. And, uh, so I wanted to find out, okay, now that I have an employee in a state, does that change how Virginia wants to treat me? Are they going to want to tax me? And uh, so I had, you know, several questions to ask. And, and I, the first time I called, I didn't like their answers. So I called back a second time and I got a different set of answers that I, that I really liked. It was more favorable, uh, meaning, no, I don't have to, there was not going to be any additional tax liability for me. And uh, I thought, okay, uh, I better call a third time. Well, the third time I called, I got a, a third answer uh, to my combination of questions. And uh, so, you know, 
uh, just be careful out there. Um, do your due diligence, make phone calls, um, ask a CPA for your help, but uh, sometimes it can still be really hard to try and take a gray area and, and get it to be black and white. Um, okay, so your mode of work, if you're in Georgia, it does matter. <laughs> you're okay if all you do is work over the internet. Uh, two people I talked to there anyway say you're not subject to, to uh, income tax. Illinois, I mentioned I spoke with somebody there today. Um, I have a, a non-resident customer who spent some time in the state, um, but uh, and they work remotely. Uh, uh, one of them as an employee and one of them as a contractor doing consulting work. And so I asked my same set of questions. Okay, your instructions say, you know, if you earned, if you're a non-resident, you earn income from Illinois sources, then you're subject to income tax. And, uh, and the gentleman I spoke with said, you know, if, if they're just in the state for a month or two, in and out, um, and their employer, the employer side of it, issued a W-2 that didn't say anything about Illinois, the 1099s that the consultant got didn't make any reference uh, to them having an Illinois address or anything like that. He said, you're fine, not subject to, to income tax. So I was happy to hear that answer, but at the same time, it still sort of felt a little bit subjective. And, um, but uh, that in a way, that's the way this is for all the rules and, and, and uh, letter of the law and explanations and examples that you can read, whether at the federal level or at the state level, things often come down to definitions of terms and what somebody thinks subjectively that definition means versus somebody else. And, and like I said, ultimately what counts is if you have a case that goes before a judge and the judge makes the decision, then you know black and white. Uh, you know, what, what was the most appropriate way and what was the least appropriate way to handle a certain situation. But, um, but don't be surprised if you find yourself in a situation where, where it's just really hard to get exact, precise clarity. You can do the best you can, get advice uh, from friends and, and a tax professional that you've worked with and know and trust, et cetera, and, and, then, uh, and then we'll go from there. Um, Okay, so um, I'm gonna check my notes. I've actually just been doing all this off the top of my head because I was rebooting my computer. Okay, the, the fourth rule of thumb, oh, the state's income thresholds, excuse me. Um, and, and by this, I mean, uh, this gets back to the old subject to tax uh, phrase that I talked about earlier. Um, you're in a taxing state, uh, you're performing services for financial gain or profit. Um, it, uh, that state, in addition to just paying attention to how much time you're there and avoiding being deemed a statutory resident, you also want to um, know that state's income threshold. So um, let's say Virginia, where the time threshold is, if I'm, I, I don't want to be there more than six months, um, but they also have an income threshold. Uh, it, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but let's just say $5,000. If I'm in the state earning an income for less than six months, but my income doesn't exceed $5,000, then I'm off the hook. Even though I'm subject to tax because I'm there performing services for financial gain, um, I don't have to file a return. I don't have to pay income tax if I'm under that income threshold. Um, some states' income thresholds are just kind of cut and dry easy if your gross income is below 5,000. Others may have a gross income test and a modified adjusted gross income test. It can get a little crazy with some of the math, but um, anyway, that's something you're gonna wanna pay attention to as well, is not only how much time you spend in there, but how much income. And again, this is where uh, planning uh, how you spend your time. And, and I would say a good rule of thumb is if you're going to be in a, in a state for more than two weeks, unless you're really making lots of money, 
<laughs> you know, like $500,000 a year equivalent, you're probably not going to make enough in two weeks to trigger a given state's uh, income threshold. So, uh, but if you are going to be in an income taxing state for more than two weeks out of the year, definitely want to look and see what their income threshold is. Organize work, your days off, your back office administrative work that isn't directly tied to earning an income. If you can, plan lower paying projects, et cetera, uh, for the time you'll be in those taxing states for more than two weeks. And then, uh, and then of course, just make sure you don't stay there too long. Because if you, if you trigger that residency trigger, um, uh, then you're, like I said, you're gonna be taxed on your entire year's income and chances are you're also gonna exceed an income threshold once they're looking at your entire year's income versus just three weeks of income, uh, you know, if that's the only time you spent in a state, so. Okay, um, by the way, I uh, can't remember if I mentioned the eight states that do not have income tax, but it's Alaska, Nevada, Florida, uh, South Dakota, Tennessee and Texas, and Wyoming and Washington. So if you plan all your travel to those eight states, and uh, um, or at least plan your work when you're in those states, then you will never have a problem with state income tax in terms of your earned income from providing services. But um, otherwise, if you're any of those other 42 states, uh, keep these four rules of thumb in mind. And I'm available. I, I think uh, George Ann will make my contact info available. Feel free to give me a shout if you have any questions. We can have an initial conversation. Uh, you know, it's just kind of a free initial consult, no problem with that. So uh, with that, George Ann, we can open it up for questions. One of the things that's been asked is, what about residual income, such as from network marketing, multi-level marketing companies, that sort of thing? If you're in a state and earning a residual income from your downline, um, do you have any advice as to how to um, consider that income when it comes to state taxes? Yes, um, you know, again, in the, in the instructions and guidelines and laws of the states, they don't deal that specifically with uh, a type of income like that. But uh, so what we can do is just sort of look at some general rules and guidelines and, and sort of create some analogies maybe to help answer that question. In, in, um, for example, what we talked about is uh, where you're working where you're performing the services that gives you the right to earn the income, that's what matters. What doesn't matter usually with, with most of the tax states, the ones I've dealt with, is where are you when you receive the income? That doesn't matter. What matters is where were you when you performed the services? So we could look at a scenario where, let's just say for two years, you were in a single state um, building your multi-level marketing business and then you uh then you started traveling and you're not actively continuing to build the business you're just collecting the checks from your downline um, so if we sort of look at that at one end of the spectrum i would say well according to the rules where you were when you built that downline is when you were providing the services performing the work that is now earning you the income that you're receiving today, months later or years later down the road. So it doesn't matter where you are when you're receiving the income, which state you're in. What matters is where were you when you performed the work that from which you derive the benefit so that you are now receiving those, those payments. So in that case, if, if during that two year period, you were building up your business, if you were in a no income tax state, then I would say on the income you're receiving today, there's no tax liability because that traces back to your where you were when you were building that business. If you were in a state, uh, if you were domiciling or a resident of a state and actually in that state when you were building your business, then, um, then you would owe taxes back to that state. Now that sort of begs the question, um, you, know, well, it, you know, what if, what if like five years later, you know, a random check shows up from work that you did, and this could be a different type of services that you were performing. So 
let's say like for me, I was performing services as a CPA um, five years ago when I lived in Virginia and that's a taxing state and I'm a cash basis taxpayer. So I don't recognize income until, uh, until I receive it. So let's just say this rogue check, somebody owed me, never paid, but it shows up five years later. Now that I'm a Texas resident, you know, domiciling in Texas, um, I earned that money five years ago. Um, now is Virginia gonna say, oh, you owe us a tax on that, that one check? Well, um, in this case, I'd fall back on, on those minimum threshold rules. Um, uh, and uh, in the current year, and I'd say, look, as a cash basis taxpayer, I pay tax on when I receive the cash, but it's for work that I performed five years ago when I was a Virginia resident. But it's a small enough amount now, today, this year, when I receive the tax, is when I would be needing to pay the tax if it was a large enough amount to Virginia because five years ago in Virginia is when I performed the work. I mean, this gets kind of convoluted. And, um, you know, one of, the, one of the questions or comments we received earlier is, you know, what state is going to be able to track all this down and keep track of it? And how much effort do we have to go through for, for a sort of a bizarre example like this? And, um, and that's where, for me, I just keep it simple. Um, but I bring that example up, I sort of rabbit trailed there, but I, I, I'm just trying to think through. So let's bring it back to the residual income standpoint. Um, so if you performed work in the past, that's what counts. If that's what's generating the income that you're receiving now, regardless of what state you're in when you receive the income. Now let's sort of shift to the other end of the spectrum. If you are um, continuing in your business of of adding additional downline, providing support services for your existing downline. Um, so in other words, it's a, it's a business you're continuing to be actively engaged in, in general throughout the year, um, as opposed to, I did a bunch of work a few years ago and now I'm sort of retired, but I'm just enjoying uh, these checks coming in for my downline. You know, you might do some minimal effort to stay in communication with them. Um, but if, if we're back on this other end of the spectrum where you're still really actively engaged in supporting your existing downline and developing, growing your downline, um, you know, then I would say whatever state you're in, when those active, uh, active work, active services that you're performing are going on, um, you know, if, if you're receiving income during that time, then you know you may have a tax liability with that state. Um, there's a timing difference that kind of makes us a little bit confusing. You may be performing services this month in a tax state that's going to produce you revenue in the future, and you may be gone and in a different state when you finally receive that. But this month, while you're in this state performing services that are going to produce future income for you you're receiving income for those same kind of services that you've been doing in prior months and prior years. So I, I think a particular state may look at all that and just say, uh, you know, we're just going to kind of keep it simple. Look at the facts and services. Bottom line is you're actively working your business for the three months that you were in our state and uh, the income that you received during those three months, even though, some of that income may have come from services you provided in prior months and prior years in different states. Um, you know, we're just gonna kind of look at it simply and just say, in general, you were working for your business and your business had income and therefore you might have a tax liability. So uh, that's, that's kind of a long answer, and uh, I sort of feel like a politician, maybe dancing around a little bit, trying to to give you an answer that has some substance. I can understand it is a very it's a kind of complicated topic without having more specific information to the individual that it affects. Like yeah, and um, you know, for me, uh, I, I I sort of my work involves pretty concrete projects. Like I do somebody's tax return during a specific 
you know, month of the year. And so it's really kind of black and white in terms of when I perform the services, where I perform the services, and how much I will eventually be paid for those services. Um, uh, the, the business of multi-level marketing and, and having the downline is, is more of a, I mean, it, it's, it's an involved, continual, uh, not nearly as I started and stopped these projects like my situation. So, um, so yeah, I, I think we just have to look at each situation in general though. I, I think, um, you know, if you're moving around the country and you're not spending, you know, if you're two to four weeks in a particular state and that, uh, that's a tax state and then you're on to another state, I mean, and, and, and most of your work is done on the phone and over the internet, you know, realistically speaking, um, you're just not going to appear on anybody's radar screen. And it's sometimes it's, I mean, we always want to know what's the right answer. We want to be, we want to obey the law. We want to do what's right. We don't want to do what's wrong, but oftentimes things like this, um, it's hard to pin down. Well, what is the precise right way? Um, what we can do is uh, try and understand the rules as much as possible and uh, manage the risk that if we're, uh, if we're in a state for nine months and not claiming anything, that's really risky. Um, and even if it's a state uh, like Georgia that where I called them and they said, if, you, if you're doing all your work on the internet, then there wouldn't be a tax liability. But you know, maybe if you're there for a really long time, like nine months out of the year, and this case goes before a different set of tax agents and eventually a judge, you know, maybe they would come down with a different opinion than the one tax agent gave you the advice that, you know, so I hope that's helpful. <laughs> yeah, and I do like the advice you gave earlier about um, when you do have to contact a state office for more specific information to make sure that you, um, if you do get a, a concrete answer to try calling back and getting a second person to give you the same answer, um, just to make sure that it's not, because a lot of the stuff is, is somewhat interpretive. Like there are of course hard and fast rules, but some of this is also open to interpretation, like a lot of law is. <laughs> um, and so yeah, that was a great advice to give to try and get the same answer from more than one person. Comes down to definitions of terms and terminology and et, et cetera, so. Yeah. Well then, so going on to some of the other questions that we got, um, so we have Brenda and John who say that the, currently their domicile is in Livingston, Texas, um, but if they want to purchase a residence or property in a different state that does have personal income tax, will they be required to submit a return to that state? Would the income be taxed? And like, it sounds like it's kind of in a civil in this almost convoluted situations, but um, can you give a little bit of insight into how that would work if they were to purchase property in a state that is income taxed, even though they are domiciled in a state that is not? Yeah, in general, you're, you're going to be okay. Just because you own some real estate in a state um, doesn't mean you're going to be liable for income tax in that state. A again, we fall back on that rule is uh, where are you when you're performing the services on the income that you're earning? If you happen to be in that same state where you own real estate, that's that's why the state would be uh, determining that you're subject to income taxes because you're in their state performing the services. But if you're if you're never in the state for an entire year, but you just happen to own some real estate in that state, there is no income tax liability. Now, if you uh, sell the property later and have a capital gain, uh, if it's like an investment property then on that transaction you'd have could potentially have a tax liability with the state but just because you own real estate doesn't mean they can reach in and go after your income your earned income um, for for other activities that you're doing if you're not performing those in the state similar situation happens with people that are transitioning into the rv life um, they may have an unsold home in their state of residency where they're sticks and bricks home has been, and they've lived for years, and they buy an RV, they establish a domicile in Texas, let's say, 
and they're trying to sell their house. They've moved out of it. Their RV is now their new residence, um, but the house may remain sold for uh, unsold for months or, or even longer. Um, so again, as long as they're not back in that home state earning income, then you know there's no income tax liability back to their old states. That's, it seems like, and it could just be the way that they worded the question, and maybe they didn't intend this to be part of it after all. It was just a, maybe a misuse of the word. But they did refer to this, this additional property as potentially being a residence. Um, being someone who's familiar, who's intimately familiar with domicile and how it, how it applies to RVing, if they're trying to establish that property in another state as residence, that becomes a conflict with domicile, correct? Well, you can, I mean, people own houses in multiple states mm -hmm. and, and you have to choose one of those to be your domicile. And, and, um, and that becomes the state where you get your driver's licenses and license plates and your vehicles and things like that. Um, so if you own a home and an RV, it's kind of the same idea. The RV is constantly moving around, but, uh, you know, we, we, if the RV is our primary residence, then we, you know, we'll choose a domicile state like Texas or Florida or South Dakota where there's no income tax um, and where it's easy to do things like renew our licenses online, renew our, our vehicle registrations online. I mean, there's other reasons why you choose a state for domicile, not just the income tax. But um, so if, if they're, purchasing a home in another state that's a tax state and it and it's not just like an investment they're going to actually spend some time living there um, the income tax liability again arises if they're working while they're living in that residence mm -hmm. now um, there can be benefits um, it, we've talked about this before if you own a home or rent a home if you have a residence other than your RV you're, you that opens up more opportunities for you to deduct your traveling expenses and living expenses in the RV if, if you've got a legitimate business trip going on um, because you're going away from your primary residence let's say the sticks and bricks home is your primary residence you're you're basically on a, a legitimate business trip if you take your RV and go to a rally uh, you know, go to the esca escapees escapade and you've got your little business and you're going to promote yourself there. Maybe somebody is, you're, you're giving a talk there or you're just going to network. I mean, you can justify that at least a portion of that trip is for business purposes. If you're a full-time RVer and you have no other residence, um, you can't write off your mileage and things like that because the IRS calls us itinerant workers. We bring our home with us wherever we go. Therefore, it's like we're never on a business trip. Um, but if you, so if you have that residence, that can open up opportunities for you to take some business deductions that you wouldn't otherwise. But while you're back at that residence in the other state, it can then open up income tax obligations if you're working and earning an income while you're back in that state. Okay. That's good to know. And then, so that actually brings up another question thinking about, um, the issue of like travel and that sort of thing. So somebody has asked, if you travel into Canada, um, what kind of challenges do you face? And I guess you kind of asked somewhat the same thing about Mexico. If you're crossing a US border, period, um, what kind of challenges do you find as you travel outside the US region? I'm smiling because it's like, oh my goodness sakes, it's hard enough to keep track of. <laughs> uh, how do I deal with other countries too? Um, well, let's see. I, I actually, we, we spent a couple days in Canada last year in the summer. We, we popped into Canada coming north from Minnesota and drove north over Lake Superior. We were headed to Rhode Island eventually. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to go that way? And, oh, it's a beautiful drive. So I was in, in the country for a few days, but, um, and frankly, I, because it was such a short period of time, I didn't even, and I did do some work while I was there. You know, we drive for half a day and then stop. And I yeah. did a few hours of work. Um, so I, I, you know, it would be something we'd have to research, but they're in, in general, you know, the U S is the same way. If a foreigner 
kind of like a state. If, if somebody from out of the country who's not a U.S. resident comes into the U.S. and performs work and earns an income, the U.S. is going to look at that and say, okay, you owe some income taxes. Now there's all kinds of nuances and exceptions and special rules. But Canada is the same way, most other countries. Um, if you're a non-resident to Canada and you're going into their country and working and earning an income, at a general level, yeah, you could be subject to an income tax in Canada. They also have a goods and services tax up there, the GST. And a company I worked for 15 plus years ago, um, we published magazines and had subscribers. So we were delivering goods into Canada and we had to pay a, a goods and services tax. But uh, I believe that also applies if you're providing services, not just selling goods into Canada. Um, but again, if, if it's probably like the different states in the US, if you're there for minimal amounts of time, if your overall income level is below certain thresholds, you're probably okay. And we also do have some tax treaties, especially with our neighbors to the north and the south, Canada and Mexico. There, there are likely some special tax treaties that, uh, that provide some definition about if, if this is the type of work you're performing or the amount of time you're spending, you know, you don't have to bother doing any, uh, uh, you know, reporting anything or filing any paperwork with, with Canada. So, uh, so again, a long answer, uh, with more specifics, we could look into it. Um, but if your time periods and, and the amount of money we're talking about is rather small, then you know you're not going to land on anybody's radar screen. Yeah. So if somebody does need to research this for their own purposes, um, maybe they're going to be traveling through different parts of Canada for four to six months. Um, do you have any resources? I mean, clearly it'd be like going to the government, but do you happen to know um, any kind of resources they can try, like help them narrow their search to find um, in relation to Canadian taxation? Yeah, Google is such an amazing tool, <laughs> or what search engine you use. Um, it, uh, the internet um, and with the states I just Google on uh, you know Colorado Department of Revenue and even if they're officially called Department of Taxation or the Franchise Tax Board like California um, even if you get it wrong and say California Department of Revenue usually it's it's gonna point you like in this case to the Franchise Tax Board so same thing with Canada or Mexico okay. you know, start with Canada Department of Revenue or income tax in Canada and these days, you can even just type your question pretty specifically. You know, if I'm working and spending three months in Canada, you know, it, it's amazing. Now, you know, with the internet, there's potential for a lot of misinformation out there too. So I always try and make sure I'm landing on the, the government websites, not, uh, sometimes it's helpful to get third party opinions and, and see what people are saying out there. Um, but like with the phone calls to the state, I, I look for two, three, four. I want to find people saying the same thing before I start to believe what they're saying is right. You know, like getting a second opinion or a third opinion from your doctor. Yeah. Um, but definitely, and then, and then even making the phone call. You know, you do a little bit of research, get some education so you can kind of talk intelligently um, with some knowledge and, and then make the phone call. And then you're going to be able to retain, you know, ask a little bit more specific questions and understand their answers and, and retain it, take notes. Um, and, you know, there, there may even be some resources on the U.S. side, IRS, mm -hmm. you know, doing business in Canada, things like that, just because we're neighbors and, and the, some of those topics would come up. But Yeah, and I venture to guess that maybe even some of the northern states would have something on their state uh, websites related to that because... I know they're same thing with Texas and parts of Mexico. Um, there are people who live on one side of the border but work on the other, and so they are constantly, daily dealing with this potential conflict of um, exactly. states and, and and taxes and that sort of thing. So, um, but yeah, that's that's great advice. Being able to Google, Google is an amazing tool. <laughs> and you know, also this doesn't have anything to do with taxes, but you know, things like alcohol and firearms crossing mm -hmm. the borders. Uh, you know, yes. definitely research before you just arrive at the border and they 
want, you know, they're going to want to know how much alcohol you're carrying. So it's better if you have an inventory already prepared. And, um, and the idea is with alcohol, they will, they don't want you bringing a bunch in to, for your two week vacation. And, and then you're, and then you leave and you never bought any alcohol in Canada. See, yeah. if you're buying it in Canada, then they get to collect the sales tax on mm -hmm. you. Um, so at the border, they will essentially assess you a sales tax, a sales tax on if you're over the limit of the amount of alcohol that you're bringing in. Of course, firearms, it's, yeah. it's not about buying and selling. It's <laughs> control kind of thing. But, you know, there are definitely rules you want to make sure you don't want to, you don't want to waste a lot of time at the border. You know, even if you're just sort of ignorantly, innocently didn't know. You can end up yeah. getting stopped at the border and wasting a lot of times. So. It does but sound it, like it's a very complicated topic to to work on simply because um, there there are so many variables to it. It a lot depends on the time length, like the time frame, the the distance, where you were and when, remembering where you were when you did certain things, and then six months later where you are now. Like it's, I can understand it is a very it's a kind of complicated topic without having more specific information to the individual that it affects. Like, yeah. And, um, you know, for me, uh, I, I, I sort of, my work involves pretty concrete projects. Like I do somebody's tax return during a specific, you know, month of the year. And so it's really kind of black and white in terms of when I perform the services, where I perform the services, and how much I will eventually be paid for those services. Um, uh, the, the business of multi-level marketing and, and having the downline is, is more of a, I mean, it, it's, it's an involved, continual, uh, not nearly as I started and stopped these projects like my situation. So, um, so yeah, I, I think we just have to look at each situation. In general though, I, I think, um, you know, if you're moving around the country and you're not spending, you know, if you're two to four weeks in a particular state and that, uh, that's a tax state and then you're on to another state, I mean, and, and, and most of your work is done on the phone and over the internet, you know, realistically speaking, um, you're just not gonna appear on anybody's radar screen. And it's, sometimes it's, I mean, we always want to know what's the right answer. We want to be, we want to obey the law. We want to do what's right. We don't want to do what's wrong. But oftentimes with things like this, um, it's hard to pin down well, what is the precise right way. Um, what we can do is uh, try and understand the rules as much as possible and uh, manage the risk that if we're, uh, if we're in the state for nine months and not claiming anything, that's really risky. Um, and even if it's a state uh, like Georgia, that where I called them and they said, if you if you're doing all your work on the internet, then there wouldn't be a tax liability. But you know, maybe if you're there for a really long time, like nine months out of the year, and this case goes before a different set of tax agents and eventually a judge, you know, maybe they would. Come down with a different opinion than the one tax agent gave you the advice that you know so yeah and i do like the advice you gave earlier about um, when you do have to contact the state office for more specific information to make sure that you um if you do get a, a concrete answer to try calling back and getting a second person to give you the same answer um just to make sure that it's not because a lot of the stuff is is somewhat interpretive like there are of course hard and fast rules, but some of this is also open to interpretation, like a lot of law is. <laughs> um, and so, I, yeah, that was great advice to give to try and get the same answer from more than one person. Comes down to definitions of terms and terminology and et, et cetera, so. Yeah. Um, and so with that in mind, thinking about some of this border stuff as well, I would assume that if you're going to be traveling in Canada or, or Mexico, my first thought came to Canada, but would apply in either. Um, do there? Do you happen to know if their individual states within the countries have similar differences in income tax like the U.S. does? Yeah, yeah. The the provinces. I again, I don't know a lot about Canada. Mm -hmm. I've, I've 
you know, back in that magazine business job, we actually traveled into Canada. I was going to say, I don't have a lot of experience with Canada, but I have done multiple business trips up there over the years in the magazine job. There would be big, we did computer magazines. There's big computer trade shows across the U.S., but also in Canada. And we'd go to Toronto for three or four days, set up our booth, you know, promote our magazine. Mm -hmm. So we were there working, uh, you know, earning an income with our paychecks. And, uh, but, and, and we just, none of this came up uh, because oftentimes with trade show related things like that, where you're in for an event and you see this in the U S with the different States too. Um, they cut you some slack because they realize it would be really onerous. Uh, the trade show business and, and conference business is huge, brings a lot of money into the States and it would be really onerous if, if they made all these employees that are coming and going for just a few days here and there during the year to have to file and report do those things. So, Sometimes you'll see special exceptions for the type of work and activity that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure the provinces in Canada are the same where they've got their own level of taxation going on. I, I would think, um, you know, come to think of it, I've, I've never looked at that closely. Do they have a sort of the federal Canadian level income tax and then also a provincial level income tax like we have here <laughs> in the US with the IRS and the state? Um, I can't imagine that they don't because yeah. every governmental agency is always hurting for money, <laughs> always wanting to provide more services, people demanding more services. So, so it sounds um, like the, the short answer is you guys make sure that you are doing your research before you, before you make that decision to, to take that trip <laughs> so, you, so you know in advance and don't end up caught in a sticky situation later. Yeah. Same as the U S if you're going to be yeah. You know, significant amount of time and I would I would say you know more than two weeks in any one province or state in the US province in Canada and then in total uh, you know even more time in general in the entire country you know it's worth looking into before you leave yeah. well as we as we wrap this up it's like that might be um, close to all the questions we have at this point as we wrap this up is there anything else you'd like to add that maybe you didn't need to cover earlier or is something that's come up it's been brought to mind I think, you know, the, the main thing is um, remember that the IRS, they, they use this terminology, facts and circumstances. So they have all these rules and laws. And sometimes in our effort to, to make sure we're abiding by the letter of the law, you know, the way this works, sometimes you can uh, get by with not abiding by the spirit of the law. If, if you if you work the letter of the law to your advantage <laughs> in essence that phrase facts and circumstances means uh, hey we just look at the situation and if we sense that you're trying to game the system and you're violating the spirit of what we of what we were trying to accomplish when we wrote that law you know technically maybe you're making a case that by the letter of the law you're okay but by the spirit of the law, by the facts and circumstances, it's apparent to us, the IRS could be thinking, um, that you're actually trying to game the system. And so we're going to, we're going to sock you for back taxes and penalties and so forth. So, <laughs> so remember, it's not just objective judgment, it's subjective as well, both when the IRS is looking at your situation and when, when we are looking at your situation and trying to determine what's the best way to report and file and pay income taxes um, and and then just keep in mind um, you know those two key factors the amount of time you spend in the state and the amount of income you're earning when you're in a particular state um, if any of those start to become significant more than a couple weeks more than a couple months more than five or ten thousand dollars of gross income usually at some point there you're getting into the into the uh, into the land of being subject to tax for that. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate your time and you sharing all of this knowledge. This has been fantastic. Um, and I, I know that you actually wrote an article in conjunction with this topic about earning income in multiple states. And so hopefully um, we'll get that published pretty soon on our website or in our magazine. And those of you who registered, 
for the webinar, you'll get a, um, we'll follow up and make sure that you get a link to that article whenever it's available so that you can take a look at it and potentially reach out to Tim if you have more questions based on that as well. Does that work for you, Tim? Yeah, yep, yeah, that's great. And, and my contact info is in the article or maybe associated with the webinar. Um, you know, anytime if somebody just has, you know, 15, 20 minutes for an initial conversation, ask some questions, get some answers, I'm available for just a free initial get together like that so we can get to know each other and, and I can help you out a little bit. And, um, and then if, uh, you know, no obligation. So feel free to contact me if anybody has further questions. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you again, Tim, so much. I appreciate all of this and hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. All right, I look forward to it. Thanks again, Georgian. Bye everybody.